question that always kind of rings true was um, across the bar in Boston, right? Typical enough Irish 20 odd year old situation. Um, and he was from the neighboring club who we had a massive rivalry growing up 12, 14, 16, et cetera, et cetera. So it was just a bit of a acknowledgement of, I know you from somewhere. Then there was that deepened a bit. And then we got chatting and with a few drinks. And of course, more things are familiar and were alike than were ever dissimilar. But after about, I don't know, maybe it could have been an hour, it could have been five minutes or something. I don't know. But he just turned around to me and said, do you know what? You're not half the dickhead I thought you were. <laughs> I I can resonate with that. I 100% can resonate with that. I think yeah. the amount of people who've said something similar to me, maybe not yeah. quite as uh, as refrained. But uh, yes, yes, I uh, I can definitely resonate with that. Uh, it yeah. is It is weird, though, isn't it? How, like you say, you know, altercations that you have with people in a public forum but through a, a a written medium, how they can just be so kind of like they can become so tension fueled, and yet you get face to face with somebody when you've got the opportunity to dare I say it perceive, you know, kind of to sort of to intuit yeah. their responses by you know like the way the eyes sort of narrow a little bit or do tiny little almost imperceptible things that we pick up on. And all of a sudden you can have a much richer dialogue. Even yeah. this medium, I know we're obviously, you know, we're separated by the Irish Sea, but still, you know, we can have a proper conversation that you would not be able to do, I think, using the medium of text and the un anonymity that comes with it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's all sorts of caveat uh, uh, constraints on, on a text conversation, you know, and that, that even is with my missus. You know, <laughs> I, I know when to get off the text and ring. <laughs> you know, <laughs> can you can you give me lessons in that? Pregnant. She's presently <laughs> pregnant, so I've become expert in it. <laughs> do you know what? That is a podcast that if we were to do that, I reckon that would probably skyrocket this cast off the chart. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> we may both be single at the end of it, though. Oh, that's true. Okay, yeah. yeah. Let's let's avoid that area. <laughs> yeah. I asked you before we started recording. Are there any no go areas? That's one. <laughs> Um, right. Anyway, look, we've launched straight into it and I pressed record because we were having a really interesting conversation and I hate missing this stuff. But um, I haven't even had an opportunity to welcome you to the podcast. You're overdue guest. Uh, I've been been following your stuff for quite a long time and I love the stuff you're putting out. Um, but I wouldn't uh, just starting point. I wonder if you wouldn't mind kind of just telling the audience a little bit about yourself and uh, your background and all those sorts of things. Yeah, so Kevin Mulcahy is my name, Cork in Ireland, Southern Ireland, if uh, people outside the British and Irish Isles may not know, it's kind of the second city in the Republic. Uh, <laughs> Quite uh, rightly too. <laughs> <laughs> We've started off on the wrong footing here now, Stuart. <laughs> um, so I'm a bit more Roy Keane than Liam Brady as well. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> got it, got it. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, I'm an SC coach, really by trade. That would be I work with uh, individuals and athletes. I'm now a club. Uh, I'm, I'm spending more and more time at one particular big urban club, which is uh, both an exciting and a, a challenging and interesting pursuit in athletic development. With that, a, a big, big, big club in hurling and football here in Cork called Douglas. Uh, but I, I have all my private work. Um, I've been coaching team sports for 30 years. I started quite young relative to most people um, because I was introduced to it by my coach, in fact, uh, who brought me along. I just had, it, looking back on it, there were slightly alternative skills, let's say, at that period where I was talking in dressing rooms, uh, talking to my teammates. I was a long way off being the best player or anything like that, but I did have some kind of leadership qualities and he recognized them. Uh, and brought me along and helped me get involved with other teams. And that was kind of the bug. And over the years, one of the things that's driven me forward, hurling and football was what I played, played up to quite recently, get a football. Um, did a lot of soccer. Soccer would be our street sport, our back garden sport. Certainly where I was from. Now, people in different parts of Ireland would have different... Uh, where they would say they played Gaelic football or hurling as their street sport. But largely, I think, Ireland, the, the street sports were soccer and maybe a lesser extent basketball. And <clears throat> I did a bit of boxing. 
don't have a huge fight resume, but did a lot of training over the years and boxed in Australia and America as well and uh, found it a great social sport and a great way to meet people in new countries in particular. So that was my background. Um, and I just started training local kids, basically, in soccer and Gaelic football and hurling. And it went from there. And then I just started running into blockages. So I did have an interest in sport in general, a deep interest. I was up early in mornings watching videos at a very young age of local teams or World Cup pilot videos and all this kind of stuff, you know. Grew up in Maradona's kind of mid-80s vintage is when I really got stuck into sport. So I was heavily influenced by them and the Dutch and then the Irish team that came along as well uh, that were competitive. So it was a great time for us at that particular period. Um, and then as I kind of, I, I worked in construction and truck driving stuff for a while because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I got good advice from an uncle at a time just to relax, you know, don't stress the leaving cert. You can go back as a mature student at 23. And I kind of took him at exactly that. And then I went back and started a sports degree um, and kind of floated in out of a couple of industries, pharmaceutical, medical device, where I was working in training and development departments. I ended up hating that. Um, that corporate sterile world was found very difficult eventually. And a bit of construction here and there with travel, going to America, going to Australia, uh, finding Irish communities uh, and whatnot. Still coaching, whether it was soccer in America, Gaelic in Australia, there was still always getting involved with teams, um, all that stuff. And then I came back, or sorry, before I went to Australia, in fact, I started to start to the SSC degree. And that basically was because it was there, right? It was unusual. I had an interest in strength and conditioning in a broad sense, fitness, weightlifting, all that kind of stuff. But I also wanted my teams to be better, you know, and I, I kind of saw that this was getting a jump on other teams. That was my initial. I was going to do two years of the degree, uh, like the cert or diploma, whatever it was. I didn't intend doing the full thing. Uh, but that's what I ended up doing because I got a GRAW for it. Uh, sorry, GRAW is the Irish for desire, like. <laughs> uh, I love, love, actually, GRAW is love. So, um, and then I, I just went with it. You know, I started working with teams in Australia. got a lot of diverse experience. And always trying to improve teams skillfully and individuals skillfully. Like that was always there. Uh, the conversations in Gaelic football from a long, long way back were about bilateral skills. Now, we didn't talk about it like that then, but like being able to kick off your weak side. So that was always tipping along. And I was picking stuff up from coaches. My first introduction to constraints, even though, again, the language wasn't what was used was as far back as 99. Uh, a guy, a famous coach who was dividing up pitches and putting time constraints from kickouts to shot and, and stuff like this. And of course, I copy and pasted them and they were successful or at least <laughs> guys, the guys enjoyed the training. So, mm. you know, that feedback loop was there. And, uh, and then I think maybe 2010, 11, 12, I was finishing the degree, there was a certain amount of skill acquisition stuff in that. It, I came across Mark O'Sullivan. I came across your stuff, I think, a little bit later. I, I, it's hard to remember what came first, but there was discussions emerging that made a lot of sense to me, you know. Um, and then once the rabbit hole was opened, it was all over. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've been, you know, adding to my knowledge and challenge ever since, really, you know, and trying to get better as being a coach. And, that's kind of driven everything. Like, I want to be a good coach. Um, and it's part of the feedback loop. The better you are, the more they enjoy it, the better they get. You know, and there's a satisfaction that just keeps on happening with, with that. And, and again, going to the ecological constraints stuff, <clears throat> you know, constantly practice designing. I, I've got better at it, but there's a lot of work in that. Mm. You know, um, but I've realized it kind of, uh, occurred to me recently that putting that practice design effort in and, and as we were talking about just before you started there I rubbed off on the whiteboard uh, a video I did recently about principles of play and what do they mean and you know I was just listening to the Constraints Collective before we got on actually and they were talking about principles of play and knowledge about the game which I mm. agree with James Vaughan is all principles are really you know mm. but how do we develop practices that are going to help us 
understand that in the game uh, and, and, you know, create practices that guide towards those behaviors or desired behaviors. What I found is that though there's a constant loop um, of challenge and reward and manipulation of, say, a practice game that I, I, I've designed is never perfect anymore. Um, you know, which is which is great. And you know, how can we challenge that? And that's as simple as changing the time constraint, you know, from a twelve second play to an eight second play and, and, and how does all that change? So uh, it's it's ongoing and that's where I'm at at the moment. I work presently, uh, I have a small gym here. Uh, I work privately with a few people, small group training, stuff like that. But I'm primarily working with three teams this year in Wintonsea. Um, and presently I'm coaching a ladies' Gaelic football team. I'm head coaching a men's senior football team. And I'm SC coach for a men's senior hurling team. So I get to wear a few different hats and kind of stand back and observe and, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff as well. So it's it's good. And I've ended up doing stuff that 85% of I love, you know, other than the accounts and the marketing and all that nonsense. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of jumping off points there. Um, I guess just to take it back, I think I, think, I could be wrong here. Um, 250 odd episodes in, but I'm fairly certain that you have the distinction of being the first sort of uh, Gaelic football and hurling coach that I've had on the podcast. So this is good, but I'm conscious that some people may not be as familiar with the two sports. Um, so I wonder if you wouldn't mind giving us a, a, a bit of a lowdown. And just just before you do, um, I do sometimes. You know how you know the sort of the the quirks of like where you're born and stuff like. Hurling, hurling would have been one of the games if I'd have grown up in a different country, you know. So I play basically field hockey, and hurling yeah. I describe as head high hockey, right? Because it just looks like the most fun. But anyway, tell tell us all about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hurling is a very ancient and historical game. Uh, like a, it could be related to sports as uh, possibly in the Caucasian, in the Caucasus. Um, but it's known as a Celtic sport, hundreds of years old, and there's some mythology with, along with it as well. But it's a stick and ball sport, and in the kind of preempt to rebellion and you know the war of independence and all that, there was a, a Irish movement of developing Irish culture. So in 1880s, there thereabouts, they started organising Irish sports, right? And and one of them was. Hurling and one of them was Gaelic football, and they and they paired them, right? Uh, other sports actually are part of that umbrella as well, like handball, and that's the court handball as opposed to the Olympic handball, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. Played in played in a squash court essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, and funnily enough, rounders. So they're the four Gaelic sports traditionally. Um, but so hurling, uh, and so they kind of unified them in the sense that they created the same size pitches. They made them 15 aside. Eventually, I think they might have been 18 aside at the start. And they're played, played on like 120 to 140 meter long by 60 to 80 meter wide pitches. So it's big. Um, so hurling, and it's funny, you've probably been uh, aware of, it's very fast moving, right? It's physical. It's a little bit, it has changed. It's a little bit more one v1 than Gaelic football would be right I, I actually I say it to people all the time because they get mixed up in coaches and coaching education and everything around it gets mixed up because they're paired so culturally that and played in the same club sometimes so uh, particularly where I'm from in Cork we're very dual that's the term we use players play both sports and concurrently uh, and that's a challenge but it's also a delight in many ways right so uh, players in particular, while it's a challenge for me as a coach these days, a lot of players will tell you, and this is how I felt as well, is that like, I love the change. You know, I love the in and out of changing the sports. But they are actually vastly different in sports. Okay, football is a running sport. And it's much closer to Aussie rules. And there is some theories that Aussie rules emerge from a combination of uh, an Aboriginal game and Gaelic football. How true that is, we don't know for sure. But um, 
Gaelic football moves slower, is a bit more tactical, and it's because of the slowness of the game, or it's not a slow game per se, but it's slower, it's probably that bit more physical. Okay, Hurling then is one on one, puck small ball about the size of a cricket ball, and uh, made a letter in twine, um, and you score in what would be rugby goalposts, one point over, three points under for both sports. <laughs> And and I'm right in thinking, am I not, that the majority of points are scored over rather than under because there's a goalkeeper under where there is no goalkeeper over. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and we're having debates in the, uh, around the both games in different ways at the moment because they've changed the equipment. And, you know, we, in this world, coaching world, we talk about changing equipment and how it can change the, the task, right? Um, the balls have got lighter. The men have got stronger. So now the game has changed and the team that is way out ahead, again, their coach uh, actually works with Phil Kearney. You know Phil, don't you? Yeah. Uh, Paul Kinnerk would, uh, has done a PhD in a ish type approach and they are just killing teams with their head, with their brain. They're just playing on a different level because everybody else is largely a little bit more traditional, let's say. But the ability to score is now maybe 90 metres as opposed to probably 60 to 70, maybe 75 was the traditional. Uh, when I was growing up, a big shot from distance was 70 metres. So that has changed now. and is um, So there's a lot of high scoring games because it's harder to defend. Um, so people are asking, do we change, this, change the rules or go back, heavy, make heavier balls? Uh, because there's less goals and goals bring the excitement. No different to soccer and other sports. Um, you know, people love the ball hitting the back of the net. Gaelic football going through a different struggle in that it got very defensive. The coaching has improved. Coaching, I would say broadly in Gaelic football is a good bit ahead of hurling. It's a bit faster to move. It's a bit more influenced by the North and Ulster where Gaelic football is extremely strong and they're very progressive and, they're determined to be successful um, at, a, at a very high, hyper level almost. And they would lean into soccer and in Aussie rules and tactical and physical developments a, a lot more. Um, but it has got a bit stale in that teams are so defensive and so technically good now that it's become harder and harder to score. Um, so, but, you know, I think that's actually evolving with the coaches now who are finding new ways to break down defences and whatnot. But, so that's where it's at. Um, <clears throat> and you, you said earlier on, the men have got stronger. And I think when you were talking about hurling, that's deliberate because the the female equivalent of hurling is an entirely different game. Kamogi, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, and different, different size uh, pitch and rules as well, or more or less the same? Same size pitch, um, slightly different rules. Again, uh, probably the worst of the organizations in terms of how disparate it is, it is from its players. Mm. You know, they're having real, the girls want it to be more physical. Mm. You know, they, um, no, it, I, you know, the refereeing has kind of evolved to the girls, you know, so uh, it's the same sport, largely. Actually, there's just a bit of the, you're not allowed, uh, uh, hit as hard which of course you know an, an, an ancient, ancient mentality you know girls shouldn't play sports I feel you know but I think it's very close to changing the rules so that it's, it's even more like the men's game but they mm. are I, I actually worked as an S&C with the uh, with Cork uh, who won an all and that, that was the highest level and those girls and it's even developed on further in the last five or six years are extremely fit and extremely strong now and are out now the athletes, you know. And and I'm involved in the women's game here locally, you can see it's dropped down. Like the standards are through the roof in Lady Sport in Ireland now and and very, very quickly. And um my, so my other thing is like having sort of you know limit, relatively limited experience, but watch watch the games from afar is like the following in Ireland is enormous. Like when the grand finals are played, I mean the the crowds are just gigantic. Hmm. Well, it's parochial, Stuart. 
So I like um there is wonderful aspects to it. There's challenges to that parochialism as well, right? Mm-hmm. But there is so it's it's actually become very defined in recent years, which is great, but there's a split season as we call it now. It causes a lot of debate as usual. Change always causes a lot of debate and mm-hmm. stress. But basically the top level sport is prioritized up to the middle of the year, from January to basically July, right? And but where I grew up, let's say there was a top level player from my club um, who was good enough to play for Cork. You play, there's 32 counties, just so for people who are unaware of it, and everybody has a hurling team and everybody has a football team and a ladies team and a, a camogie team as well, largely, okay? So, and they would all probably generally go all the way down to under 17 and then maybe development spots as well, okay? So, um, <clears throat> if if my teammate growing up played for Cork and made the senior team and plays at the top level in the present format he would play with them till July but he comes back and plays with me in the club championships for the rest of the season so you know there's a great connect to the stars uh, which works positively I think for most people they don't get too carried away or um, removed let's say from where they're from Um and their friends get to play with them and the locals get to be around them and the kids and uh, all that kind of stuff is a really positive element of the Gaelic Games. And and then, of course, even for Cork, you know, playing, say, Kilkenny, Tipperary, neighbouring counties with traditional hurling, you know, everybody wants to go. And that's where you get the crowds from. So it's deeply, deeply, it, it's it's nationalistic, it's, it's parochial, it's even... It is still quite related to the War of Independence and all that. There is still, you know, a very Irishness, rebellious kind of element to it that uh, is probably struggling with itself a little bit at the moment. But, you know, it's finding that balance between becoming a a newer country and and maintaining the traditions of the sport. Um, Ongoing battle, you know, different people come from different perspectives, so... But that's the reason for the crowds. That's the reason because it's really rooted in where you're from. Um, and I mean, it, when you were talking earlier on about the, you know going down the rabbit hole, sort of the ecological rabbit hole, so to speak, you know, it strikes me that um, the dynamics of the sports, um, you know, extremely fast moving, high, you know, over significant distances, but still requiring you know, kind of major levels of coordination, both between teammates, um, but also then interacting with opponents over distance and all those sorts of things. It just lends itself to an ecological worldview, in my in my opinion, like a lot of dynamic team sports do. Um, that's not to say that other sports don't. I'm just saying that, you know, whenever you see those dynamics of, you know, kind of numbers of participants in a particular area, competing against other numbers of participants usually involving some form of invasion those dynamics just sort of almost immediately speak uh towards a kind of uh, an ecological perspective because the minute you isolate individuals from those environments you are immediately impoverishing things and therefore you you but you seem to be unless i'm much mistaken of almost a a singular voice in the GAA community um or albeit i imagine there are others maybe just less less vocal but not is it would it be true that you're still in a relatively sort of minority position or is there a an underground that i don't know about I, you know what, what's the story um so the most like the answer is largely yes i mean um I, there's someone very close to here that I'm friendly with and some of the guys out of uh, MTU, CIT, which you would have been aware of and I've met, yeah. uh, Ed Collin and, and Kevin Murray and those guys who would be, uh, Kev, I would know quite well or we speak to every now and then and worked with him before. He's very much down that ecological. Kev is in a unique position as in he is an All-Ireland medal winner as well and has played for Cork and that has massive weight in hurling a disproportionate amount of weight in coaching and management, right? But, um, 
And as I said, the the coach of the best team who are looking very likely to break, be the first team ever to do five in a row all Ireland at the highest level, is Limerick. Um, it's looking more and more odds on every time they play this year. And their coach, well, I'm not sure. I I don't know him. I've read his stuff. Uh, I've observed some of the training sessions, and I'm quite aware of people who, who know him better. And uh, it's very ecological in in a broad sense. You know, mm. he's his paper would touch on game sense and a lot of the teaching games for understanding and a lot of that stuff as well. But like, he's definitely streets ahead in hurling. Like streets, and it, for me, it's hard to explain to people sometimes. But I'm like, people call him a genius all the time, you know. And he's clearly a smart guy, and clearly a very, very good coach. Um, and and they've got a great manager as well, you know. So, but from what I'm seeing, is he's developing principles of play, uh, and training the team or coaching. The team in a way that they are going to develop themselves as a, a as a kind of the on-field decision makers you know and they are so in control on the field in and how they play the game and when they press the buttons uh, it's just they're excellent to watch um from a team performance point of view they're up there with anything at any level in any sport that i've seen um so there's that. That's the highest level, and 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 he is a standout. You know, he really is a standout. Um, and there's a lot of people I've had. I've run coaching courses, and I consult with a few people, and there is huge. Uh, well, there is good interest in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now again, most of the people who come to me are from the north of Ireland and from Gaelic football. I would say eighty percent. Right. So again, there's that culture there of wanting to be better of want to do their best for their teams and, and it's highly competitive at every level right so they're looking out and looking to learn new stuff and, and all that kind of stuff uh, where I'm situated myself in Cork it, absolutely I'm fighting against like you know it's we are the biggest county we have the most clubs and we're grossly underperforming but if you want to look at it from the, the elite and in inverted commas side of things but the games themselves, I would have concerns about it. I mean, it's not going to go anywhere, right? The The game is, is loved, rightfully. It's skillful. It's enjoyable. You know, if you walk in as, say, an outsider, uh, an Englishman, American, a Dutchman, whatever, came and watched it, still it's very good. It's very exciting, right? But there is elements of the game that have gone, that have been over-sanitized. And a lot of the players now are looking very similar. So we don't have any first time hurling anymore, which would be connecting with the ball overhead or on the ground and moving it past. So that's a loss because that was spectacular. And there was a little bit less prediction of where the ball would go. Uh, it's become a possession, more possession based game, despite the fact that it's made for fast moving excitement, make one on one battles. Right. So um, it's deeply traditional. And I would say, based on what I observed, the people I talked to, uh, I would say it's such a baseball or out ahead, in my experience, in terms of just being so traditional and, um, you know, very nostalgic, like very, very nostalgic. And some of that nostalgia has been mistakenly, not, not deliberately in any way, but mistakenly, you, you know, I think this happens in a lot of sports, but they go and ask a famous hurler, what did he do to be great, right? And I went down the alley and played off the wall with my brother, you know, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, I did it myself. But the wall, like we've built walls all over Ireland at GA pitches. It, it, it's the most bizarre thing I've ever, like I, I, I can't find anything else in sport that doesn't make as little sense. <laughs> um. Because the narrative came as media became more prominent that all the best players hurled off the wall when they were young. And, and, you know, I did as well, endlessly. And it was a way of getting away from my parents or getting outside for fresh air or just passing away an hour. Um, and it was very enjoyable. Or I might poke around my dad or my brother or my friends locally, you know, whatever. But that became really entrenched in the folklore. 
And literally, what has happened is they've built walls so you could go practice. And like, the walls are beside the pitches. And the pitches are empty. And, you know, I... It was recently with a team. And look, we did have bad weather, okay? And, you know, there were certain pitches closed because of waterlogged. That's fine, you know. But we ended up with... 28 under 16s, right, in a place probably three quarters the size of a squash court that was astroturfed <clears throat> as a hurling wall. And instead of being given the pitch, which was beside us, empty, full, you know, once 145 by 60 diameter pitch, whatever it is. And like one of the kids came out and like was just walking through, going, Why can't we play here? Like, why aren't we using this? Uh, and it was just bananas, you know. Um, and that's very common. So if you build it, you're giving the groundsman the opportunity to keep his lovely pitch even lovelier for longer. And, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> people laugh at it when I say it, but it's actually a big problem because I, I think it turns off certain people, certain kids. Um, they go, like, you know, a lot of kids go there just to play the game. A lot are there to mess around with their mates. A lot of them are obsessed with getting technically better. And we need to accommodate all three versions, you know? Um, so, it is a struggle. It's surprising to me, you know, football, Gaelic football moved on when a great Dublin team came a few years ago, uh, very well coached, very well managed. Yet this Limerick team, which is very well coached, very well managed, for like Paul Kinnart may disagree with me, I, I'm just going to say it's more of an ecological approach, certainly from the outside. And nobody wants to know about it. <laughs> You know, I, I'm being a bit harsh on certain people. I, I'm sure they're curious. And I'm sure, you know, and what I have noticed, funnily enough, right, is that, and this is very informative for me, I'm coaching Gaelic football in that county, right, because it borders Cork. Uh, and it's a f just 40 minute journey up the road for me. And in that county, though, there is a drop down effect happening because of that coach and this team. And there is a little bit less uh, willingness to accept poor coaching. And I know the players themselves, you know, the players I'm working with, even though it's football, right, it's the other sport, but they are very responsive to the stuff I'm doing with them. A lot more than I would see in my own county. And some of them are inside in development squads and things like that, or had been part of different squads inside the Limerick uh, setup, or their friends that play with Limerick or whatever the case may be and it's just really strange phenomenon maybe it's not just Ireland but that a county line a, a line and an imaginary line really you know can have such a fundamentally different culture because of one team or one man or a couple of men you know um, so yeah it's a struggle um, but I suppose at the same time I've decided to continually put stuff out there and coach away when I get the opportunity as best I can and that uh, eventually the pennies are going to start dropping and probably it's a lack of success where I'm from is what's going to help the penny drop. You know, the continued lack of success is hard to, to uh, you know, supporters get on people's backs like what's going on, what's going, you know, uh, and it, it comes out of the wash eventually. That is fascinating, though, isn't it? That, um, like you say, you know, you can be, you know, a couple of miles apart and the culture can be radically different. Yeah. Um, and would I be right in thinking that over the years, because of the resources and the history of Cork, that it's it's had a dominant position for a long time and is now struggling to come to terms with not having that dominant position? I think that's the nub of it. Absolutely. Um, there was, I don't want to say laziness, right? Because mm. people work hard when they go into these jobs, you know, sure. uh, you know, there, there's nobody not trying their best in, in most cases, but there is a laziness because of the numbers. Mm. And, um, and what I noticed, even within clubs, big, big clubs in Cork, and I would see it and I'm a broader sense, let's say with the, the under 20 team or under 17 team or something like that they don't give guys time to adapt to the level. Mm. 
because there's another guy, 90% as good or there, thereabouts, uh, ready to come in. And you just don't see the, the level coming through. And, and it's crescendoing now because I think there's an excessive pressure on everybody to be successful. And right. it's not it's not healthy for anybody, you know. Um, and you can see it in performances, and um, and you know it's because again, as a, due to the parish, county, parochial structure of it, people are deeply like success has a massive effect on participation. You know, I'm sure that's the case in a lot of places, but it would be noticeable in, in Ireland, I think, or certainly my experiences. You know, um, like the Cork Ladies Gaelic Football Team were very successful for a number of years and they had a massive effect on ladies football in, in Cork and the development of that game. Because for the same reasons, you're within touching distance of some of the players, you know, and that connectivity is there and there's a bit more maybe inspiration. You can actually meet and touch and feel and, and be spoke to and even coached by and taught by a lot of them are school teachers. They they actually literally teach the, the kids. So um that you know, everybody. I think everybody just wants competitiveness. At the end of the day, mm. you know, of course, we've got to win. And if we lose by a small amount, and we're going towards getting better, and we might be there thereabouts next year, I think most people can deal with that. Mm. If you're highly competitive and you can see there's you know progression and stuff, that's not there at the moment. So you know, I am. Um... I am fascinated by this notion of you made me laugh when you said to me about how, you know, people have done the counterfactual or the sort of the retrospective analysis of great player noticed that there's a correlation between their street experiences and their performances and therefore then went and tried to recreate the street experience by the side of grass and then denied participation on the grass. Um, that it There is like, in any other walk of life, you would you would look at that, and the only possible explanation you could come to is that is that those people had lost their minds. But <laughs> it happens in so many walks of life. Yeah, I, I Stuart, uh, and this is not exclusive to hurling, right? Mm. But I have friends, right, very successful people, and I observe people in other walks of life, and they are fantastic parents like run a fantastic business or great employees or a great employer or whatever, okay? And they walk onto a pitch with hurling and they lose their mind. <laughs> Maybe not visibly, but like they become completely different people. Um, and it's, it's a strange, strange thing. But, I mean, and I, you know, it does come from a very positive place, the cultural heritage and richness of all that like and the uniqueness i think uniqueness is something that uh we latch on to a lot and and, and is good but we kind of have to check ourselves every now and then as well you know um why are we, you know I, i've done a, quite a lot of coaching courses sometimes out of uh curiosity or i've ended up in other sports like hockey and basketball and i did the foundation level of both of those for instance right and i actually ended up doing the ssc part of level one in the basketball right as as a as a tutor but one of the things that and the Irish rugby is also excellent at this right um, the, one of the first things they all do is ask why are you here you know what are you doing here like why do you want to be a coach why are we here as a group what, what, is, the, what is the end game and I just find now it, it does change right and people will listen to this and get upset because there is some very very good coach educators out there there is some counties in Ireland that are doing amazing jobs. And I'm even starting to see changes in competition structures, and which is indicating an overall change of mindset in that direction, that we are here for children and to keep them in the game. Uh, ultimately, that's the starting point, you know. But it is like in hurling, it's it, the... I heard this from a coach educator, and it, it is a, a term used in the narrative, in the ether of hurling for years, okay? And it is, if they don't have it by 12, they'll never have it. <laughs> and I, I've kept the video where someone from a prominent NGB, uh, there, would, there would be layers to NGB and get a games because you have 
the GEA, you have the provincial councils, and then you have the counties, right? So they're all NGBs in their own way. And this was from a prominent provincial NGB, the head of it, saying this near the start of a prison. So I'm just trying to give the example, like that's, we're looking straight away to hothouse these kids between five or six and 12 and make them technical experts. Um, and I've been shouting this for seven to 10 years in particular, since I really got my head around what's going on, I suppose. And then I was, you know, I probably taught that on some level at some stage. Do you know what I mean? I, I probably did. I can't really remember, but like it was probably there as something I assumed in some way, you know? Um, but the only thing I would say to me, no, it's obvious it hasn't worked at all. You know, hurling participation has dropped. That's a fact. Okay. There is no getting away from that. I don't know why that is in particular, right? I personally believe it's the over technical approach to coaching from a very young age, right? That's my personal opinion. It is a hard sport to learn, but that's the excuse thrown back all the time. Or they weren't up to it. I really accept that. Um, and so you're going with a technical model hard and early at the moment, right? And I, I do have to make a caveat that there is individuals and separate counties who are not doing that. They are putting the children first from the word go. And then you look at hockey and rugby and basketball in Ireland, at least in my experience, and they're saying, why are you here? Right? And I think that's a big difference. You know, now we could make the argument, and the basketball people that I'm friendly with would say we might be better at some of that stuff because we have to be because mm -hmm. we're small fry, you know. Um, and but you know, whatever <laughs> it's it's happened, it's good that uh, we have examples of those sports doing that, you know. Um, so that's that's one of my challenges with hurling. I mean, the game is amazing. I was a good bit better at hurling than I was at Gaelic football, but I drifted to Gaelic football because I found it hard to deal with all this stuff. To be honest, looking back at it now, I just the over intensity of it, the, the all that kind of side of it was just wasn't very attractive uh, to me when I was when I was kind of you know twenty twenty one twenty two, um, and that's where it's at. But and it's hard to get that point across without hardworking volunteers who are just doing their best getting a bit upset by that thing, you know. <laughs> um, I don't blame any individual coach really, like because who's leading this? Yeah, yeah. There's a systemic cultural thing that needs to be broken, and you can't blame the individuals for being a product of a culture and a system that has been allowed to grow and flourish despite there being plenty of evidence to the contrary. Exactly. Um, just one quick yeah. question there, actually, just something I'm interested in. You mentioned how hurling participation in certain areas has dropped. Is there any linkage? So, for example, in the areas where they're not following the force feeding of the technical model from an early age, are they, are they, thri are they seeing increases in participation or are they maintaining participation where the others are declining is there any correlation between the two um someone better placed than me now from the research point of view might make a fool out of me but I, i'll say a few things because the demographics of Ireland has become more and more urbanized so there's population shifts that will confuse this to a certain degree so someone might come back at me and say you know uh, so accepting that part of it, that I, I'm not embedded in, in that side of things. There has been an increase in participation in Dublin. And Dublin is certainly a leader in coach education. Okay. I would know one or two of the guys involved. And the general approach is child first, let's say, uh, in a broad sense. Yeah. Uh, is that correlation? Is it historical work that was done in certain areas? You know, I, I, that I can't answer, right? I just like the attitude of Dublin, and there is it's a fact that hurling participation has increased over the last, I think, 10, 15 years, okay? Now, there's a population shift there as well. So, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, is it percentage of the people playing sport? Is it the percentage of the people in the country? Overall, we know that that's gone down. Okay. Yeah, I'm just intrigued because um, sometimes it's hard for those of us who work in policy making and, you know, in the, the world of coach development and coach education, sometimes it's hard to make the connection between policies around coach education and coaching practice and the connection with increased participation, greater participant satisfaction, um, retention rates, and all of those sorts of things. Often you're looking at sort of macro population data. And the way you can sometimes do that is to, if by just some, by natural forces, you know, you've got areas of the country with a given a roughly equivalent demographic and a roughly equivalent population base. And in that, in one area, we know that there is a sort of a, a policy around early and uh, sorry uh, early delivery of highly technical instructional models and that sees a lower participation rate and then you've got another one which is much more like let's say you know kind of much more i guess i suppose we call it child led but let's or child first but let's say it's much more driven by enjoyment and participation and activities and it's less driven by technique and competition and we see an increase then we can begin to start to draw some conclusions. And there's not many places where that's the case, you know. So I was interested because you've got those 32 counties, and they're all going to be mini fiefdoms. If there are differences by, be, between them, and there's a correlation between a particular philosophy and increased participation, and another philosophy and decreased participation, there may be some interesting things to draw from that. I'll get the researchers onto it though. I'll get Ed, Ed and Phil onto it. They they probably do the work. Yeah. The problem there, Stuart, is I'm sure they would do it and they have people like Kevin and Con in their stable, let's say, who are from very much from that background, you know, but they wouldn't be allowed. Yeah, of course. I've challenged people to even down to ecological practice design, I would say. You know, I'm willing to put any team I coach uh, in some case studies if needed. Uh, the problem is finding someone else who go and go control or go and do let's say a more ip approach or whatever you want to you know discuss drill based approach and i don't know this irish culture i don't think we're ready for that you know real comparison stuff we just hope we kind of learn from these guys over here and then it's comp as well because you know you have a place like that engages everybody in the game and I've noticed now that they're really making an effort they're actually holding a, a seminar on the constraints that approach uh, upcoming I don't know in the next couple of weeks um, with coaches their coaches both at development level as in the representative underage kids and the and it's open for coaches to go to so then you have culture hitting development as in they want to stay ahead they want to be better and then there's a deep 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 love for it but i would argue in some ways they're the ideal size of a place to kind of help and con control this to some degree you know uh it's not vast like cork uh it's not it's a tidy size we would say you know but mm. then the embedded culture is is phenomenal you know it's mm. just it really is unique Mm. yeah it's fascinating you right at the start of our conversation you talked about practice design and you talked about how i think the words you used were you know constantly doing practice design and the challenge of that and it's interesting because actually one of the things about the ecological approach is you know you know it's it's your practice that is doing all the heavy lifting you know the carrying all the water for you because you're not using as many of the other coaching interventions as much, you know, whether it's verb verbal instruction, feedback, and all those sorts of things. You're manipulating environmental constraints as a means by which to modify behavior. I'd be interested just to sort of get some, I guess, perspectives around practice design within the world of Gaelic football and hurling 
and also you know kind of the challenges and the the issues you face and you know i know i'm still working on some of these things and i haven't got all the answers for it but i'd just be interested in anything that sort of comes to mind as far as that's concerned Uh, yeah, well, I suppose uh, Gaelic football would be predominantly where I, I would uh, have coached in recent years. Um, largely, I suppose I break it up into three kind of um, ideas or concepts about how I, I designed the training sessions. Um, I will have broad, I have a hierarchy of principles, right? And the top of that is human movement. So, you know, there is a limit on how we can jump high, run fast, uh, jump long, sprint, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I suppose because I'm coming with an SNC experience and background as well, I I'm looking for gaps, right, physiologically and tactically. If you want to look at it like that, or tech, tech, but you know how someone plays the game. So. I will play full games with constraints. Um, I'll play phase of play, and that might go into full games. So, like kick out games, I play a lot of kick out games because kick out is a big part of Gaelic football, and it's a restart. Um, so how I will start, and I'm going through this process at the moment, and actually only Tuesday night had a discussion. Um. And this has evolved over the last couple of years in particular, where, again, I'm getting quieter and quieter. And I, I like, to, particularly with a new team, I like to let things hang. So we've done stuff like create leadership groups. And, you know, I talk to those guys here and there, and I want their ideas. And there's a bit of co-creation, hopefully, developing now. This is a new team I'm with this year, by the way. So um, how are we going to kick the ball out? You know, what are our strengths? So we just play a kick-out game to start with, right? So every time the ball goes dead, or if you get a score, it goes back to your goalkeeper. And let it evolve. Like So we're, we're repeating the kick-out quite a lot, a bit more than would be natural. Um, but once it's kicked out, we're playing the game. And then, and I do that in week, uh, you know, week five maybe, first four weeks be very general play and, and conditioning and stuff like that, right? So, um, and then we'll have a chat about and I'd have observed it. I might try and guide towards certain things, but, you know, 85% of the time, the players see the same things you see, you know. So, uh, with that kick out, then I will start constraining to a forward. So, what I will start doing, and I've got much more comfortable with this in the last couple of years, is we'll play a kick out game now, which we did Tuesday night, right? And we've played five games in the season already. So we've seen a few things that are working, a few things we struggle with. We're not a massive team. How are we going to deal with teams who press up against us? We're going to have to figure out a long kickout. We've agreed that as a group, right? Um, but in the short game, getting the ball off to a player in a short or medium kickout, we're very good, right? And the movement's good, and the goalkeeper is exceptionally accurate. Okay, so... We're reasonably happy with that, but we, we'll nail some things down around that later on because teams will... So So what I started doing then is I will talk to Team Yellow Bibs or A Team A or whatever it is and say, all right, we want a 4-4 four four press, right? And I'll say nothing to the other team. And we'll do that repeatedly. So it, play the game, but every time they get a kick out, you're going to press. Yeah. Full, a zone will press. And then there's conversations happening with that. Okay, so we're lucky we actually have three goalkeepers. There's usually two there in the night. So that's a critical uh, phase of playing Gaelic football. And, and that's evolving now. So the other night, there was a discussion about zonal press, which is you put four into full forward line, four in the half forward line, and four across the midfield. And even though they did that, as one fellow, I, I won't use the exact language he used, right? <laughs> But the opposition, the team with the ball who were kicking it out got through them too easy, right? And, and why did that happen? Well, we just went into our zones. He kicked it to the cornerback and nobody kind of did anything. So that, so that, was, that was a good thing to happen, actually. And it was great that one of the, his, the team involved actually noticed that. 
well, obviously, if they get the ball, we still want to push them into the corner, use the sideline as their friend, condense the space, hope they make a mistake, and that's the trigger, attack for a turnover. You know, so that stuff we'd been working on in general play, defensive play, but like for some reason when we went to a zonal press, uh, they forgot about that, right? So, <laughs> so, you know, but that's, you know, you have to have these conversations with them. And then I probably get to a level soon where I will give them each a kick out long and short. Oh, so I'll get them to come up with a kick out long and short. They don't have to tell me. Uh, I'm just a referee, really. But I will give them both a different type of press. So I might tell one team, he's on the press, one team, man to man, and see what happens there. Um, and slowly but surely, so I'm not starting with principles of the team. I'm hoping principles of the team will emerge. Um, and when things get chaotic and championship and all that kind of stuff, that we'll have something to lean into that will get us out of trouble. So I, that's probably the easiest description of using um, the way I do things, say a phase of play or something like that. And then in a full game, if I have the numbers, but it could be just 10 v 10 if that's all we have. But 15 15 sometimes, I was lucky with the team, I was with the last two seasons previous where we had big, big, big numbers. Um, I to speed up so a lot of teams press in the middle of the Gaelic football these days okay so I would use a constraint of maybe start depends on the age and level might start with 10 seconds to get through the middle okay or else the ball is turned over where you have it and it's a free to the other team and we work that down to 6 seconds right and that's hard right because the middle zone is 45 uh, sorry it's yeah, it's about 45 meters. And obviously, there's guys trying to stop you. So you have to... And what starts happening then is they start picking up good positions, right? So they get they generally nearly always get turned over the first one or two goals of it. Uh, and there's all sorts of frustration and giving out to me. And this is a stupid game. Why are we doing this? This is not like the match and blah, 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 blah. blah. But um, they get it eventually. And so that's a very specific thing then that's related to the, ma to the game as it is presently. Um, but I suppose is a good idea to move the ball fast anyway. I love it. I love it. There's so many things I want to ask you about. Um, one thing I was going to say is, um, I'm going to want. I really want to dig into because I do something very similar in, in the world of hockey that you do with your kickout games. But I'm going to come back to something. You said you had three ideas or concepts around how you design the practice and use like a hierarchy. And the first one was human movement. What were the other two? So the principles of human movement. Yeah. The principles of invasion sports. Ah, okay. Right? Yeah. The principles of our team. They'd be the three. And underneath that, then we'd have units or lines or whatever the sport might dictate. Um, you know, defenders or defensive midfielders, or it depends how deep that goes. And then the bottom one is like, the individual responsibility. So your individual, I call them actions. I try to stay away from the skill. Um, you know, how you interact. No, I don't talk to players like this, but like how they interact within those units and within the team. Um, and that that just gives me a framework. Where, where are the gaps? Is the human movement gap an issue? Because if you're not fit enough to play senior football, you might be quite skilled. You might be very intelligent but there's a certain need to be able to run uh, or tackle or stand your ground or whatever. Uh, maybe that's the gap I need to, to, to close. Uh, principles of invasion sports, how experienced or how coached have they been in the past? So again, I could go over the county bounds to Kerry and they are deeply, deeply embedded in the principles of Gaelic football. It's something they grow up with. It's taught very uh, organically. Um, they understand space. They understand runs from out to in versus in to out. They understand the danger zone. Them. Whereas where I'm from, we, we're not as good at that, right? We we tend to be more athletic. Run, 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 run. A, a very broad moniker there now. But, you know, so my work with guys from Cork is probably at that invasion sports level before we ever get to... So going back to Mark and say James Vaughan's work and all that, like, you know, 
and even the Italian uh, cat, cat, I talked to them the name I can't remember Catapoca cat, 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 yeah. I, I'll come back to you on that mm. uh, the Italian <laughs> soccer idea of closing an opening space oh we, cat, Catanaccio Catanaccio yes <laughs> we have the ball we open we don't have the ball we close so I would be even at no I could do that with 13 year olds right but some of the people I meet have never been taught in that or coached in that way. Yeah, so, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I start at that level and that could be really successful, you know. Um, and then I'll go, right, what, 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 how are we going to do that? How are we going to create the space and what are our strengths? So there are team principles then. So if we're big, we'll play a certain way or predominantly. But I'm still thinking about, and then when it comes to the tactics, it's over through around. Again, going back to James and Marks and trying to keep it simple, you know, this team is very good and they load the middle, they don't let us through the 45, they, they protect the D. So we're going to have to go around them or maybe we go over them. And the team I was with last year, which I won't have this year, is we had a very competent player who was six foot five, and, and one or two other guys who were big and strong who were good in the air and they'd mix it up that we could go long. So even if teams blocked the middle, parked the bus in Jose's kind of language, we could go over that. And it was very disruptive, you know. So uh, that's cutting your cloth then at that level. Mm. Yeah, 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 I understand it. On the on your point about um, there's a couple of things that came to mind. Firstly, with this idea of the kick-out game, I do a lot of something very similar, which we refer to in the world of hockey as outletting, which essentially is your your restart. It doesn't start with a goalkeeper. It starts with a, a player and yeah. you're restarting and you're trying to take the ball from close to your goal towards theirs. And you're actually exploring the construct constructs around over through around. Yeah. Um. Sometimes over is, is less of an option because of uh, coaching a women's team and generally speaking, their ability, the strength capabilities to go over aren't always there. Some are, but not all. And therefore, that's not that's not an affordance. That's not an opportunity for action. Therefore, we're generally looking at through and around. Yeah. Um, so, but interestingly, I do something similar where I'm setting tasks. I'm either setting tasks for the group that are preventing them bringing the ball out, whether it's through different pressing formations or different yeah. trap areas. And the benefit of that, of course, is you get the coordinative stuff of pressing and defending yeah exactly. <laughs> um yeah. you know built in sort of two for the price of one sort of thing and then um or i'm setting tasks for the uh the group bringing the ball out in order to do the coordinative work with the group who are trying to sort of set traps to then be able to do rapid counter attacks and those sorts of things yeah. so interesting how there's some parallels i think in again again you know invasion game parallels and then something else you said around this idea of the, well, the response of the team to the zonal press or the lack of response. Now, for me, that's such a great example, I think, of the impact of uh, sort of uh, an ecologically inspired approach to team coordination and dynamics, because you've put together, you know, you've essentially put in a probe there, which essentially has said, right, we're going to do this defensive structure. And the team, ostensibly, you know, you're looking at how the team in possession or bringing the ball out is going to be able to react to that. But what you then observe is actually when given this particular defensive framework, a group of individuals don't necessarily know how to coordinate. Mm. So they get that information and they're able to then, you know, kind of, talk to each other about what that has now taught them about that response and you're getting great information from a observing and b you know kind of hearing what they say about it and they're either going to self-organize either yeah. live in the moment or they're going to self-organize through some sort of hot review or even just sort of review subsequent subsequent review after action review uh, or they're not and if they don't then there's obviously an opportunity to step in and if they do then great you don't need to do anything because actually it's happening 
But it just strikes me that without that perturbation, sorry, not perturbation is the wrong language, but without that stimulus, the probe, if you like, of that sort of tactical framework, none of that would have necessarily emerged until the game, the match day. And then that's when you see coaches losing their minds because individuals aren't self-organizing because they've yeah. been told to do something different. Exactly. And if you take an X's and O's approach and you could have very good ideas and you tell them this is what we're going to do and it could tactically be absolutely the right thing to do against the opposition you're playing. But if they haven't experienced it and trashed it out the way that happened the other night for me. Now, I like to that as well. I very deliberately create principles and questions, right, that we started the season with that. Like, there's a three Ds of defending in, in Gaelic football, which is as old as the hills, to be honest, but it's still very valuable. And that's delay, deny, dispossess. Okay, so we delay them if we can. We deny them space then, and if we have the opportunity, we, we tackle and dispossess, turn over. Right? So I reminded them of that, okay, and that we even have that in a team structure. So our whole team is, it's not just about the actual action of turning the ball over. We have a 3Ds approach to defending in general. We're going to try and delay them and push them into the corners. Uh, we're denying them space then by everybody pushing up a little bit and we're trying to turn them over as a team. Okay, So I was able to ask them, did you think 3Ds happened? Right? And they're like, nah. You know? And so there's a realization and they're largely prompted coming up with this themselves. And they were getting hammered. So they were despondent, in fact, right? So, you know, these are competitive guys. They're trying to make senior football team in a traditional club who, who value success, you know? So um, there's a kind of an inbuilt pressure there, you know? Um, the other thing then was the questions. So to you simple questions, especially I think near game day, that really can simplify it. Um, and I've been using this more especially with the girls team I'm working with at the moment because they seem to have reacted to this a bit better than, say, the more principled stuff, right? Um, so if we don't have the ball, am I close enough to make a tackle? If not, then I must get between the ball and the goal, okay? So then I can, we can try that zonal press or man-to-man -man press or whatever kind of a kick-out strategy, defensive kick-out strategy we want. We can do anything. We can drop off, give them the easy ball is another very common tactic to get a football. And but we still have that question, you know, can I make a tackle? Am I close enough to sprint down and, and turn someone over? Am I, or to delay the play? If not, what can I do? And that is, you know, cut off their line to go, their eyesight, like mess with their eyesight. So this is the kind of stuff I talked about. So then we do the zonal press and uh, it just doesn't feel like anything they've done before, you know? So like, how could I expect them? I mean, I probably did expect them to do something a bit better than what was happening, but at least it highlighted it. And, and, and then there's this awareness that, that they're coming up with, from, uh, they're coming to me with, not me saying, you know, and sometimes, don't get me wrong, Stuart, right? For all our talk about coaching, trying to be the best we can, being balanced, sometimes, obviously, you are definitely more guarded with children, with, with youths, different sections. But, like, there has been times in the last couple of years when I've gone, this is your effing job. What are you, like, you know, we, we are, there, there is a certain time uh, and, and they need, that, that's the level they're at. It's an aggressive sport, you know. But you do want to get to a point where you've co-actively or co-coached with them that this is an agreed approach for us, right? Um, and But ultimately, in the ideal scenario and the most successful teams, as I'm sure most people even listening to this will agree, is it was self-driven or there was somebody in the team who was asking those hard questions, you know, and, and and kind of being the coach on the field or being the coach in the, in the line or the unit or, the, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and it, there's a skill and it takes time to identify those guys and put them in the right space or girls for that matter. Uh, and that's just another side of coaching, you know, the management side, let's say. 
Yeah, it makes me think actually, because I really like that framework of the, like you know the kind of the human movement principles, the invasion principles, and the sort of the team interaction principles. I started writing some notes alongside that around, you know, on the human movement side. You know, you've got the action capacities, haven't you? The action capabilities, uh, they're not always the same. Likewise, when it comes to the our team, that's around that's around interaction. To borrow from, you know, Mark and James again football interactions they talk about don't they or you know invasion yeah. game interactions and again that strikes me that there are interaction capacities and interaction capabilities yeah you know we have i have a group particularly at the moment who they have interaction capabilities but they don't have the capacities because in certain circumstances particularly moments of high stress their capability for interaction decreases they go within themselves and they become silent and isolated. And so we do a lot of training in those tr trying to sort of represent those high stress environments in order to try and develop the interactive capability that are required for coordination. You know, I've got some individuals yeah. who clearly have been taught over the years in environments that are very individualistic. Yeah. and very technically driven and they're the ones who often come to me with the questions of what should i do in this situation yeah and my response is nearly always it's not hockey by numbers mm. i need you to I, I need you to tell me what you think you should do in this certain certain and then we can begin to have a conversation about the different options that are available to you and the the pros and cons related and it's so interesting how they very often are so dissatisfied with that you know, the idea yeah. that they ought to be the architect and the author of their own actions in a team environment seems so anathema to them because they're very used to the idea of an individual saying, this is what I want you to do now here in, in this situation. Yeah. And I think that's related to just school as well. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and, and other parts of life, which and that's a, a normal phenomenon in a way because of the way life is in 20, 21st century. Yeah. But... Uh, just reminding me there was two anecdotes in relation to some of the stuff we spoke about, right? Which will be interesting. And, and maybe this is a Gaelic Games specific thing, right? But it's happened a few times. But last season, so I was explaining earlier that the top players come back and play with uh, the local club, okay? Mm -hmm. And it was actually that six second rule game, right? And we were playing a 15 v 15. And one of the players who plays the highest level uh, in the middle of the game, lost the plot with me. Like this is a stupid game. Why are we doing this? These it's too hard. It's it. They can't do it, right? And he's kind of half playing the game, half tackling and giving out to me in the middle of the pitch at the same time. <laughs> and but what I've realised over time is that, and I have to explain to this guy, this probably isn't for you. Because it's for all the other guys who are not as a, he is an expert decision maker. The mm. timing of his runs is probably one of the reasons he's played the highest level. Mm. So, you know, uh, that was an interesting thing that I've seen with a few of the better guys. They're probably already really good decision makers. They know where to space the pitch. They know the timing of the run intuitively or they've developed it obviously over the years, you know. So that was one interesting challenge that I've got recently. Be, uh, with this uh, ecological approach that, particularly with adults who've made their way to the top or are very good players at club level even, they, it, they can be the most resistant mm. um, to some of that stuff. The other thing then was actually last night, just when you were talking about interactions there, uh, largely coincidentally, but we put three sisters in the half forward line. Okay? Mm. And very good players now, like really athletic, genetically run all day, greyhound type, uh, athletic ability and good good footballers and one of the girls that had played half forward recently was moved into the corner and because we were winning well and we can use roll on roll off we took her off uh, one of the more established players but she played in the corner and she was clearly angry at me <laughs> coming off right and she hated it but I had kind of had noticed that the three sisters and I don't think this was in any way deliberate just ran through the opposition, the three of them together, and passed the ball to each other and were able to kick wides or scores uh, and actually took the other players out of the game in the inside line, the full forward line. Um, 
just because of the way they were playing, uh, because of their familiarity. And it was just a really interesting thing to watch. And then we kind of got back to playing the way we were playing all year when we just made one change. We moved uh, one of the, the centre forward out to midfield and brought another girl into centre forward. And it's just, you know, that family interaction and the yeah. familiarity they had. Uh, I wouldn't say upset the team. They actually played really, really well. But it, it upset a couple of the peripheral players who were maybe used to the ball arriving in different spaces at different times. And, uh, so I suppose it speaks to changes, doesn't it? If we were, as a, from a tactical selection point of view or anything like that, we really do have to consider when we make a change, do we have the time for this change to, to adapt and mm. to be useful? Do we have the time for it to be a failure? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, and, and reverse the truck or whatever the case may be, go back to what we were doing or do some other change um, when we're designing. And I think the heuristic I use with absolutely nothing on any ease of anecdotal kind of approach, but is the power of six. Like if you're introducing something new, I feel it takes like six training sessions before there's a real grasp. Or if we're using a small side of game or something, or a phase of play, a kick out, so whatever the case may be, it seems to be somewhere around six sessions, six practices that it, that it, the penny starts to drop. Or if you're with a new team, it probably takes about six games before the concepts or the changes you're trying to make kind of even look like what you're looking for. Or, um, and uh, so it, uh, that's something I've learned over the last five, six, seven, eight years in particular that like, um, Ideas can be dangerous. You know, we, people like us think a lot, oh, that might work there, that might work there, but we have to be careful with the changes we're going to make um, and how we can upset good players who are, you know, just by a positional switch. Yeah, but it, it, it actually, that's interesting in itself, but um, the, the, I think are, it's interesting the power of six, actually. I'm probably going to test that. I think yeah. you, I think you're probably onto something here. I think you're right in the sense of the time it takes for some of these things to, because of the organic nature of them, you know, because you're not trying to force feed it, you do need that little bit of time for the kind of the the the, the sort of the nuances and the interactions to be absolutely to allow that to sort of become more embedded. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. The interesting thing for me is um, a how rarely we would think necessarily of using six sessions as a mechanism to bring about change. Ordinarily you do one and you expect it to embed. Like, I mean, that's such, you, you get such a shallow amount of kind of, of development in that kind of one session activity. The other yeah. thing I, the other thing that occurred to me was how um, your point about the, in, an intervention and you have to be careful about an intervention and its impact so one of the things I actually like about the ecological approach is I've definitely felt in the past using a more directive approach that I would destabilize quite considerably by tinkering or doing whatever it might be, thinking that I could manipulate or create some level of control. And actually what I've found is that um, this is a much, because it's a, a more intuitive feeling your way approach, organic almost approach uh your it it's less invasive so you you don't necess you can tell when things are beginning to be assimilated or not you know you can feel it you can sense it you can intuit it the players will give you the feedback and so when that doesn't materialize you know you've got the time and the space to be able to allow it to sort of find its course a little bit like water going down a hill and yeah. you're not forcing it in, if you like. You're not wedging it into a space that's that it's not ready for. And you can adapt as well, of course. You know, you you feel resistance to the method or resistance to the practice, and so you tweak and adapt. And ah, oh, now we've got a better comfort level, so the the trajectory of improvement can be tweaked and amended at the same time. So I feel like there's a lot of safety net baked into the approach in some respects. Yeah. I think that goes back to the, the feedback loop um, that I was talking about at the start, maybe. That's, you know, the redesigning or the constant designing um, mm -hmm. allows flexibility. And I, like anybody else, when I started coaching, uh, was a, an obsessive planner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and slowly, 
not that I don't plan now, but I give a kind of a guideline where I might go with something or, you know, how long this might take. But um, you do, there still is, though, eureka things. Yeah, whether, definitely. Whether it's a game or a training session or I had it recently. And look, part of it as well is the management and the emotional connections and the enjoyment and the social side as well. Uh, certainly we're in Gaelic games, I think that's a massive part. Um, like, and one of the players actually said this to me, I think half jokingly, um, which Irish people do a lot. We do a lot of half joking. <laughs> um, it's our passive aggressive way of, of sending a message. <laughs> but is maybe you're not a bluffer actually. <laughs> That is the most passive aggressive compliment you could ever have, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're not a bluffer, actually. We might have just found the title of this podcast. Perfect. Right, <laughs> yeah. right at the end. Um, yeah. Hey, listen, Kevin, I could speak to you all day, but unfortunately, I uh, I've yeah. got to get back to the grindstone. Um, I've loved I've loved the chat. It's really been great, and um, Absolutely. and also thank you for your patience in um dealing with my ridiculous both work and life scheduling issues i've had to cancel you or move you about 16 times it feels like so i appreciate your perseverance in uh in having the conversation um yeah no i mean i just love i love seeing what you're talking about in the social space you put out a lot of great content uh what well, i know you do quite a lot with various people like you said earlier on you know people come and work with you so what's the best best place for them to come to to get in touch um my email or twitter really i think uh the movement coach KM or at movement coach KM is the Twitter handle and the movement coach dot KM at Gmail mm. is the email. Um, I have the design the game project. You could find it on Facebook, which people can sign up to. That's kind of my coaching. Um, it is a project. I think project is the right word for it in that it's, bringing people along in a kind of discovery of coaching in general, but very much ecological constraints of approach. You know, I do videos through Substack and whatnot, write articles um, on whatever comes into my head, <laughs> you know, um, but kind of based on my experiences as I'm going, because, you know, there's no better way than uh, exploring these things than the day to day. I'm lucky. I mean, I had six coaching sessions last weekend, which would be a bit uniquely over the top, but like I do get a lot of practice. Uh, I get a lot of interactions and I deal with, you know, the Irish women's basketball team down to uh, lower grade football team and, and everything else in between, which is great. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Design the game, Substack, you could follow that or the Facebook group if you want to join that. There's I don't know, 20 or 30 videos and different uh, things I've put up over the last two or three years, which basically came out of COVID, you know. Um, so, yeah, that, that would, they'd be the places to find it. Great. Brilliant. Um, I'll have to I'll have to follow that Substack. I didn't know you did one of those. I don't know why, okay. but I haven't yeah. tracked that yet. I'm getting uh, There's a lot of good Substacks around. Graham, there is, uh, yeah. I found Graham. one there the other day, the, a comeback guy. It's really good. Right. Uh, I I I'll try. I'll put it out there on Twitter some soon. Um, like just nailing the ecological approach, <laughs> you know. Uh, which is the great thing, Stuart, because like I can see young people coming through now. Mm. I've seen the way, say, physio and strength and conditioning have developed so much in the last ten years, where I, I would have been tearing my hair out ten years ago. But now these young people coming through are streets ahead of where we were. Mm. Uh, and I'm starting to see a little bit like the coaching science degree that Ed and them run in MTU. Yep. Like I'm talking to footballers now about ecological dynamics, um, you know, who are doing that course, for instance. So, you know, that's the cycle of it. You know, you need people banging the door and eventually the door opens. Brilliant. All right. Well, um, I really appreciate your time. Um, great conversation. And, um, all the best with everything you're doing. And I am way overdue a trip to Cork. There's for two reasons. One yeah, is yeah. <laughs> my wife's in the uh, wellness space and there's a fantastic company that's just started in Cork that she needs to go and visit. And I'm a due, overdue okay. because 
because I want to basically, it's obviously the ecological hotbed, not just of Ireland, but of the world. And so uh, I need to come over and uh, basically immerse myself with you, with you people and, uh, and spend some time. So don't I will definitely tell, be. Don't tell, don't tell other Irish people that Cork is the best at anything. They get, <laughs> they think we're arrogant and cocky enough as it is. <laughs> Oh, and the rice, you know. But... <laughs> All right, appreciate it, Kevin. Speak to you again Good. soon. Take it easy, Stuart.